You're listening to the 95 Podcast from the team at 95 Network, where we host conversations specifically designed to support leaders in small and mid-sized churches. Everybody. Welcome back to the 95 Podcast. This is Dale Sellers, Executive Director of 95 Network, and I have two of my favorite people in the whole world with me on this particular podcast. Uh, I am so thankful for the friendship I have with Carl and Shelly Vaders. And Carl, this is your fourth or fifth, I don't know, I've lost count now, podcast that you've been on with us. So it's at least four. I think maybe this is the fifth. But Shelly, guess- this is your first one. You know, so if, if it's his fifth one, is it like SNL? He gets a special coat? He gets, he has, I give him all the 95 Network five swag I can get him. Five Timers Club? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him all the swag we can find. And, and, and in, fact, in fact, next time I'm with you, I'll just get some stuff off your table and give it back to you. All there right. you go. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Doing good. We are doing really well. We got a new season of ministry going. We got a lot of stuff coming up and uh, we'll talk about as little or as much of it as you feel like. Well, the first thing I want to do is uh, there's always new people listening. So Carl, take a few moments and just kind of let folks know uh, about your ministry and who you are. I mean, I consider you to be the guru of the small church space, and I'm just glad that we're even friends. And then uh, I I want to talk after that about your transition you just made, and then I want to dive into the topic of why I have you here today. So kind of let, in in case someone doesn't know who, who Carl Vaders is, give us just a little overview. Sure. Yeah, we oversee a ministry called Helping Small Churches Thrive. It mm-hmm. began 11 years ago when I wrote the book, The Grasshopper Myth, out of some of my frustrations with trying to follow the church growth principles and not having them work for me. And I thought I was the only one for whom they didn't work. <laughs> and it turned out, uh, no, I was actually a uh, uh, right center of that uh, uh, of that bullseye right there. A whole lot of folks mm-hmm. like it, 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 it was, these pr- church growth principles were not as inevitable uh, as I had been led to believe. And uh, so instead of pushing back and getting, ang- getting angry about it, I decided, well, what does a healthy small church look like? So I started writing and speaking about it from uh, my experience and from whatever resources I could find. And the resources were very few. As you know, even today, they're still few. But 11 years ago, they were almost non-existent. And so for the last 11 years now, we've been uh, speaking and writing and podcasting and having conversations uh, to, one, encourage small church pastors, two, to provide small church-specific resources to small churches, Mm -hmm. and then number three, to mainstream this message into the larger church world so that even those who are coming from a denominational or a large church standpoint can have a better understanding of where the majority of pastors are ministering from. What's it been like? Have you been received well? Is it Has it been crickets? What's, what's it been like? It has been received way better and much larger and much more widely than we ever could have anticipated. It has really been something, the invitations to come and speak, the places we've been allowed to go, the conversations we've had with amazing pastors who are doing ministry completely under the radar has just been one blessing after another, after another. That's so cool. You know, because as you said, uh, when I started leading 95 Network, I, one of the things that we do is focus on small and mid-sized churches. And just noticed, man, there's just not lots of resources out there to help folks, you know. And, and I pastored a small church for 12 years, and it grew from 30 to 300 to 150 because <laughs> we had mm-hmm. a terrible split in the eighth year. And then we actually closed it um, uh, four years later because it, it it was unhealthy because I was unhealthy. And all that led to me having heart surgery. And we don't want people to go through that stuff. <laughs> nope. You know, no. you've been down that road. I've been down that road. Now, how long you guys been married, Shelly? Why are you asking me? Why aren't you asking him? Because the woman <laughs> always knows. She always knows. <laughs> 40 and a half years. 40 and a half years. Wow. Yeah, it'll That's be 41 amazing. in July. And Gina and I will be 41 in, in uh, August. Yeah. So y- y'all got us by a month. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. It's gone by really fast. Especially to be as young as we all are to be married that long. It's just, you know, we were, we were like early teens when we got married. <laughs> So you guys have just gone through a recent transition, you know, Carl, part of what you didn't really mention this in the, in the first there, but you've also pastored a church there in in Cali for a long, long time. Tell us a little bit about that transition. Yeah. um, We pastored this church here in Orange County, California for 25 years. It was where we went through a very similar arc to what you just described, a church 
you know, from 30 and up to actually just about 400 for a while, and then under 100 for a while, and then it finally steadied out at about 150 to 200. Mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, right around there that I started uh, doing some of the research and some of the writing that I was doing. And then as this ministry, Helping Small Churches Thrive, started to grow, we started realizing that this was really where the Lord was calling us. And we started reducing our role at the church until six years ago, um, we actually had the transition where my youth pastor, who had been my youth pastor the entire 25 years, wow. uh, he became the lead pastor. And we stepped aside and I became one of his teaching pastors and did that for six years. And then about two years ago, Shelly and I started looking around and going, okay, so far we've been doing this ministry by really kind of responding and reacting to requests. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to be more proactive and to look around, okay, okay, what is the Lord calling us to do? What are decisions we need to make? And as we started seeing where the Lord was leading us, we realized we can't do this and have any responsibility at my home church on staff anymore. Because when we come off the road, I need a place to go where I can be refilled mm -hmm. rather than just one more place to be putting things out. So for the last two years, we have slowly handed off all of the remaining duties that I had at the church to other people. I am now unnecessary at my church. <laughs> which was by design, but it is still our home church. But now when we go, we get to get refreshed and renewed and revitalized again, rather than having one more place where there's a whole bunch of output. Yeah. Shelly, when you were growing up, did you have any thoughts about marrying a pastor? Yeah, none at all. <laughs> no, not in my scope at all. It was, no. Were you anti it or you just didn't cross your mind? Never crossed my mind. Yeah, because yeah. I know a lot of girls were like, you know, I'm not marrying a pastor. And a lot of them that have married pastors used to say that. So I was just wondering. So what was but, it like to you, Shelly? Tell us a little bit about you growing up. Uh, well, I'm a California girl. I was actually born like five miles in this from this area. So when I was five, we moved to, to south of San Francisco, which is where I grew up in the Bay Area. So I'm a NorCal, SoCal girl um, and met him in Silicon Valley. And yeah. So I think how, how, did, how did you meet Carl? Um, well, I mean, I grew up in the, I would say I grew up, I stopped going to church at 14 years of old, 14 years of age and had some wayward times there. And, uh, 19, my, the Lord called me back. I gave my heart back to the Lord, went to this church in Sunnyvale, California. And his father, the next year came to pastor the church. Mm. I saw this gorgeous six foot six guy. And I'm like, Oh, that he should talk about me, not my dad. <laughs> his son, his son. <laughs> thanks for, hey, Carl, thanks for my clarifying that. Carl. Yes, yeah. I want to clarify. Well, your dad's only 6'4", so see true. there. So, yeah. So, yeah, his parents brought him along. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, I was, I was, I had been in ministry uh, myself yeah. as associate pastor before that, but was between ministry jobs. So my dad was going to this church and I went, I'll go along and I'll help you out because I got nothing to do right now. So yeah. I showed up to help my dad at the church where she was uh, already attending. Yeah. And uh, I'd been there a year. The pastor was leaving and his dad showed up and wasn't looking for anybody. Um, in fact, I was dating somebody else at the time. And uh, what? I know. <laughs> Was it so, yeah. was it love yeah, at first sight? <laughs> was, uh, pretty much, yeah. almost, yeah. I mean, we both remember the first time we noticed each other, so yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't call it love at the first sight. It was wool baby at first sight. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it really was. So that was July Fourth weekend, and we got married the following July Fourth weekend. Yeah, it, it was close to love at first sight. Then, if you got married within a year, <laughs> it was. It was and, and we were young. When I think about it now, we were so young, but we were old spirits. I mean, we were old folks, old souls. I think is what yeah. we would say. At we were twenty one and twenty three, but I was old at twenty one, just because of life and and. You were always an old soul. So we felt really old, even though we were. Yeah. And even young. the people around us were like, yeah, you guys are older than you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, and here we are 40 yeah. and a half years later. Odd, oddly, uh, Gene and I used to hear that a lot. People would say that, you know, you, you guys act like you're a lot older than you are. I don't know what that means to us today though. <laughs> and that, uh, hopefully I'm saying the opposite now, you know, who knows? <laughs> I hope so. Sure. <laughs> so tell us, uh, what about your family? You got, you got kids? We have three children. They're all in their 30s. So our daughter, Veronica, um, she has two children. So our two grandchildren, um, her husband, Sam, and our eight-year-old redheaded grandson, adorable, Connor. 
And Abigail is our little five-year-old um, and she loves me very much. And she tolerates me. <laughs> Just say it. She loves her grandma. <laughs> anyway, um, and then we have our, our sons, Matt and Phil, they're 36 and 33. And they both live, I mean, all three of our children live, you know, three miles this way, two miles that way. So we're all here. Yeah, are basically are homebodies, so, huh? Yeah, keep them, we're keeping them here in Fountain Valley, Huntington Beach. Yep. Okay, so with that in mind, I know the transition that you're about you're about to make. So, kind of walk us through what you're about to do <laughs> now that you've stepped away from the the church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're continuing to do uh, help, helping small churches thrive, and um, we're we're hoping to to be able to ramp it up. Our our goal is that we want to be able to help the churches that typically don't get the kind of help uh, that seems to be available to a whole lot of folks. Uh, and the first part of that is so much of what's created to help pastors is created from a big church context. And a lot of it only works in a big church context. Mm -hmm. So we have been creating resources for small churches and we want to be able to increase that. So that's why we're going full time. Um, we're going to be on the road a lot this year, the next uh, in February and March uh, here, here in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, in February, we're going to be yeah. in. I think it's 10 to 12 places in the U.S. And then in March, we're going to be in nine places in Europe, actually. Uh, we're, we're And most of them are going to be in towns where they almost never, and some of them never get people coming in uh, to teach pastors and to resource them in ways uh, that they really need help with in their situation. So uh, our hope is to be able to do more of that to have people come alongside us. And we're hoping then to build even what we're going to call a small church collaborative. Uh, we want to expand our website to where we uh, make it a home for a lot of the small church voices out there that don't have the size of a platform that either even you or I have right now mm -hmm. and whose voices really need to be heard because there's some people out there that are creating really good small church resources and nobody knows about it. So I want to give them a voice. Carl, how do you get connected? Because you, you've done a lot of things or in my mind, a lot of things overseas. How, how did that come about? Yeah, it's it's been from reading my articles or uh, reading uh, one of my books. Those have been the primary ways. So um, uh, the, the articles when I for for five years I blogged for Christianity Today, Christianity Today, mm -hmm. uh, and that gave me a really really large audience internationally. And so I, I started hearing from folks like that. And then out of that, the books that I've written uh, have been translated into Korean, German, Spanish, French, French. and Croatian. And mm -hmm. so when you take a, an American church leadership book and put it in a language uh, of these countries, uh, there's a real interest in that because we in America are inundated mm -hmm. with church leadership material, mm -hmm. good and bad, but we got a ton of it. Yep. They don't have anywhere close to the amount that we do. So when we were able to make inroads with one or two translations, and then folks in other countries could read it, uh, we became in high demand for that because there's just so little of it for them. That's so cool. And Shelly, you get to go too, right? I go on pretty much every trip. Not, not a, There's a few that I don't go on, but most of the time I do go, yes. Yeah. I do the driving. I do the, I do everything, but speak. I take care of everything. This, so it leaves him free to speak. And um, he doesn't have to worry about all that. So, cause a lot of the times we're driving sometimes eight, 10 hours in between conferences. And if he has to do all of that, it just wears him down. So I like to drive. I do all that. I do all the, you know, planning and know where we're going and all that kind of thing. That so. lead, that's a good lead into why I wanted to have you guys on. So this <laughs> podcast is going to air the week of Valentine's. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I w wanted to do today was just kind of walk through what it's been like uh, to have to be married in ministry. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, now we've got we've got, you know, this, the, as we've been dealing with the stresses that churches have worked through and, and everybody's worked through on this side of the pandemic, going through the pandemic and stuff. But there's a lot more <laughs> than, than that. And so, you know, what were the early years like for you guys when you first started pastoring the the church that you were at for so long? You know, what was it like for you, Shelly, when you guys first started out? Um, well, um, when we first had our, when, when we went to our first church, we were mid twenties. Um, uh, I, I was, I learned a lot. 
it, it was, I mean, I grew up in the church, so to speak. I didn't spend my teen years in church. So, um, um, it was, it was an adjustment to, um, having everybody look at you differently or, um, well, okay. Let's just say I, I learned, I was told early on not to have good friends in church, you know, have good friends outside, um, not to, um, you know, your best friends in church because things happen. And I thought, no, 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 I'm going to change that. You know, that's not that I'm going to change it, but I'm not going to, I'm going to have friends in church. Well, at our second church, this one um, found out that there's a reason why that you need to have good friends outside of church, not in church. And um, I mean, you can have good friends in church, in addition, don't get me wrong, in, in addition, addition to, to but if you're going to have somebody that you need to talk with things about, um, you don't do it with people in the church. Um, you you know, there's a limit to how far you can go. And I understand that. Um, I, I learned that lesson. <laughs> But um, it, but the overall, it was um, it was a learning experience for me because, like I said, I, I was not one who had that um, call from God that I was going to marry a pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a different lifestyle, you know. Um, is it like being thrown in the deep end of the pool? Uh, sort of, I guess. You I mean, weren't, I, you weren't trained. Yeah. You, you, didn't, you know, you, you didn't even have expectations. I'm assuming. I mean, just from the the one pastor's wife that I remember growing up. I mean, I was too little to remember the other ones, but um, the one pastor's wife. I do. She was a career woman, so um, so she wasn't the 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 wife who stayed at home and did everything. And she was an actual high up in her career in a high end company, mm-hmm. and that said a lot. That um, that 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 told me a lot uh, that you can have a career and be a pastor's wife and do all these other things. But it was a bit of a learning curve, especially in your early twenties. Actually, first, you, need to, you need to tell them about your first experience in about to become a pastor's wife. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. That one. Yeah, okay, I had a couple without. Um, okay, so Carl and I, so in our district, we, you know, I'm sure most districts, most, most um, denominations have this, they have uh pastor's wives retreats, or at least they did back in the day. Anyway, so we're about four months out to get married. And so as a, as a, um, pastor's wife to be, I went to the pastor's wife retreat and, um, the first night there, you know, it's what two nights, three days, something like that. So the, the first night there, you know, there's a service and all that. And I, in the sanctuary, and I, I, I really wish I had taken a picture. It's something on the banner that said something about burnout and anger. And I thought, Mm-hmm. Huh. All right. This is going to be interesting. And so the superintendent's wife, she was the speaker that night and, you know, spoke and did all that. And at the end of her sermon, she said, now all of you, you know, who are feeling the anger, the burnout, you know, blah, 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 you know, come to the altar and we'll pray with you. Well, the altar was flooded. Okay. This is just pastor's wives, yeah. missionary wives, you know, ministry wives, right? And I'm like, my eyes just went, whoa, like what? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, oh they're, no! Like they're, <laughs> they're they're experiencing trauma at the altar, and it was crying and wailing, and I mean, not everybody, but you know, some of them. I'm like, okay, no. So I got up out of my seat, not head down there. I went to the other direction, and I there was a phone booth, phone booths back in the day, and where you could see into the sanctuary, just where this particular um, retreat center was. Mm-hmm. And I called him, and I said, "Listen, this is what's going on." I mean. I explained the whole situation. I just said, is this what I'm in for? Because if this is what I'm in for, I'm out. <laughs> did you really? I did. I said, I'm not doing wow. this. I'm seeing from this burnout and anger and all this. I said, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And uh, so I said, yeah, what did you say, Carl? Down. Yeah. So I said, so is, is my, my mom, my, my mom was a pastor's wife at the yeah, time too. And they had there. gone with the staff of the church. Yeah. So I said, is my mom there? She says, yeah. yeah. I said, is she one of the ones who's, crying and all upset up front. She said, no, he's helping those who are crying and upset up front. I said, well, that's more like what your life is going to be. So when this is over, sit down and talk with her about what it's like for her experience. And you can even ask her about me and what I'm like and whether or not I'm going to put her put you through that. Mm-hmm. So my mom had to talk my future wife off the oh, yeah. off the cliff. <laughs> So what, I was, was, what was your conversations like for the next few weeks after this? 
You know, I, honestly, I don't remember our conversations. But I think that night between Carl, especially what he talked with me about. I mean, I don't remember word for word. I do remember him. T- I do remember telling him, this is what life is like. I'm out. You know, well, I, re- I remember I, one very specific conversation because we, you came back. We talked about it. And um, you said, I don't know that I'm called to be a pastor's wife. Mm, yeah. And I said, are you called to That's be my true. wife? I do remember that. I do remember that. And she yeah. said, yeah, I'm called to be your wife. And I said, that's all I'm asking you to be. I do remember I'm that. Not yeah. called, I'm not asking you to be a pastor's wife. I'm asking you to be my wife. Mm-hmm. And between the two of us, we'll sort out what that means as far as the yes. pastor and as far as the church is concerned. But if you're, if if yeah, you feel the Lord right. wants you to marry me, then that's all I'm asking you to do. Because yeah, I talked to you know a lot of women, and, and I know some girls, um, you know, growing up, some did become pastors, but they always felt a calling to be pastor's wife. I'm, I'm like, okay, what's wrong with me? Because this, I don't feel this calling. I, I don't know what I'm called to do, but um, I don't feel it. Like I hear all these other women saying that they went to Bible college or whatever. And I, I mean, I met him after he graduated Bible college. Mm-hmm. So that was not a thing for us. So um, yeah, but no, that's right. I, I, you know, I've, I don't want to say fallen into it, but this is years later. Now, this is the path that God called for me to be in ministry with Carl. So but it took me a while to figure yeah. that out. We, you know, right out of the gate, we had kids and then life changes. So, Paul, did you, just because you grew up in a pastor's home, did you already have some certain things that you wanted to guard her from and guide her? I mean, do you have a plan? This, like, yeah. this is the way I wanted this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I did. I, I'm a third generation pastor. So I wasn't just raised by a pastor, I was raised by a preacher's kid. Um, so uh, it, this is very much a part of our lives. And my father and his father before him, were really good examples of how to, first of all, of integrity. Who they were in the pulpit was who they were in the home. Uh, I remember when I was a preacher's kid and I'd visit other preacher's kids and we'd hang out together. And in way too many of their homes, the dad that I'd watched preach on Sunday was really different in the house around the kids. Mm -hmm. And a real shocker to me because my dad was exactly the same guy in both places. There was an integrity of his life that didn't change one place to the next. So I saw that and went, that, that's who I've got to be. I'm not going to live two different lives. Secondly, he made a separation uh, uh, between the, the home and the church, whereby, for instance, um, if he was going to use an example from home, he asked our permission. And if we were even slightly, no, that's is not a story I want you to tell to anybody. He said, no problem. I'm not going to touch on it. And so I did that to my kids. I never, ever talked about my kids from the pulpit without getting their enthusiastic permission beforehand. Like if they were even iffy, like, yeah, I guess it's okay. I wouldn't do it. But they were like, yeah, I want you to tell that. That's cool. That was the only time I would do that. And then the third one was we didn't put expectations on on either mm-hmm. Shelly or on our kids mm-hmm. that they had to behave a certain way because you're the pastor's wife or because you're the preacher's kids. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't come to that as quickly with Shelly as I should. There were times in the early years where I put expectations on her that I should not have put on her because she was the pastor's wife but we never did it with the kids. Mm-hmm. So even any time somebody, and it didn't happen a lot, but a couple of times somebody would go to our kids, I can't believe you don't know that verse and you're the preacher's kid. I can't believe and you don't we, your Bible. Yeah, right. and we'd go to those parents, after, mm-hmm. the adults afterwards and said, don't you ever put that on my that. kid. That's my children, yeah. your so children. We, we put up very firm boundaries and I think they were very helpful uh, for us in, in moving forward so that the, the people understood. And, and even when we came to our current church, uh, I told them, you're hiring one person, you're hiring a path, you're not hiring a couple. My wife is a Christian, and she will be involved in the church, and she will volunteer, and she will help out, as any other helpful involved member will be. But do not expect her to do certain things simply because she's the pastor's wife. And some of that was because, well, we had had such a bad experience at the previous church, but also, too, but the previous two churches, um, because one of them was so small. I had basically been three to four years in the nursery. Mm rarely in church and it's like i i just i can't do go to a new church and do nursery again i haven't been in church in almost four years um Shelley, I, you know, why did you do that because there's nobody else there's nobody else when you're at a church and you've got single mothers with two or three kids they need to be in church they need to hear the word at least i'm I'm reading my Bible every day. I don't know if they are, but they need that time away from their children, that knowing that their children are safe. Mm-hmm. But, and when there's only one service, there's not a whole lot to do. So, I mean, yeah. And it was, it, a, it, it, was it was a really tiny church. So it, it was, was really either, 
it was either yeah. folks in their 60s and 70s yeah. or it was the single moms themselves watching the kids yeah. and in many services she was literally the only person who either wasn't too old or wasn't already one of the parents yeah. to cover for it i think we could have done a better job i should have done a better job we and were given learning. her time away but we were trying to figure it out as we, we go and to, as we go, to yeah. us it was this is what pastors do we sacrifice yeah. ourselves for the congregation yeah. and we have now since learned that there are boundaries to yes. draw on that yeah I was, uh, yeah, we should be young and learning. I'm so, so glad you said that. I came to this church though, 31 years ago. I was a mess. I was broken, and I and I, I it could not be a two for one like all, all of them are. It's like I just I have to back off. I have to learn to trust again. I have to learn to know what it's like just to be in church again because I'm I'm not trusting of anybody at this point. So let's do this. I want to take a short break and I want to come back and dive into that just a little bit more, if you would, Shelly. Okay. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Carl and Shelly Vaders. Back with Carl and Shelly. And you kind of teed us up, Shelly, with that last comment. When you said you, when you came to this church, you were broken. What, tell us some, what you can tell us about what that was like. Um, the church we were at before this one, we were there for 20 long months. We had gone there um, with certain expectations that the board had told Carl, you know, salary and all of that. And um, they didn't come through. Um, we had, um, we had, we basically lived there with um, three children and infant, toddler and one in school. And they, we lived on three or four meatless nights a week for dinner because we didn't have enough food to buy I mean, enough money to buy food when you have to buy diapers and all these things. So, um, and it, it wasn't was because they couldn't afford it. It was because they, they simply chose to pay us a little. They chose. Mm -hmm. We were scraping by. Um, and just there were some things that happened of naming names and things coming out in some meetings um, that you, as a Christian, you don't, <laughs> these are your brothers and sisters in Christ and they're treating us this way. It was, uh, it, it broke me deeply and um, it, it was just, um, it broke my mind. It broke my spirit. It broke who I was. And um, then we're making a decision. Okay, we made the decision to leave because we, we decided this is a smaller town. It's a wonderful town, wonderful place to raise children. But um, we thought we, I, Carl, I remember Carl saying at one time, we can stay here for five years, you know, in, and um, fix it, learn to grow with it, change and all that. And we were like, both of but us were like, we can't do this another can't month. Put, yeah, we can't put ourselves and our ourselves. kids through five years. We can't put our, put our kids through this. It got to the point where our kids were being um, uh, shunned, shunned, and shunned by, by others, by others in the, that were their friends. And when that happened, we Mama were Bear. like, Mama Bear came out then, didn't she? Not doing that That anymore. was That was when I, no. I said, you know, I love these people because Jesus tells me I have to but I don't like them and I'm I not going like to stay them. with people I don't like. I, mm -hmm. Now, not everybody in the church, obviously, but yeah. leadership and, and some others. So um, by that point, I was just, I had already been through about four months of this. Um, I call it kind of a mini breakdown. I think I had a bit of a mini mental breakdown because it just crushed me. And, Looking back uh, now, would you still say it was a mini breakdown or was it just a yeah. flat out breakdown? No, uh, I, uh, I guess it, it was I, at least mid sized. It was, <laughs> yeah. It was, it, there was a time, I mean, during this time period, there was a time where for three weeks, I literally couldn't put food in my mouth. I couldn't swallow it. Yeah, that's a little more than me. Get it down. And this is from working in and, a church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I couldn't, and I, and I knew something was wrong. And, um, but we didn't have money to go to anybody or anything like that. But when you can't eat for three weeks, I lost about 30 pounds or something because I physically just, I, I could get the food in my mouth, but I couldn't swallow it. From stress and uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right. I, I want to ask you a question beyond this, but before that, Carl, what was it like for you watching this happen to your wife and your family? How, how did you handle that? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was that's harder than dealing with it yourself. Yes. Um, I, you go ahead and attack me. I'm the pastor. I made this bad decision. I made that bad decision. But um, to put that on my wife, to put that on my kids, um, mm. that's I, nothing is unforgivable. <laughs> uh, the cross 
tells us that. But it's as close as I've ever been to feeling like you've done something that I could never forgive. That's as close as I've ever come. Did you and- have someone to turn to, to help you do this all by yourself? And um, the reason I'm asking this is I know what it's like. I, I had heart surgery at 53 and mm-hmm. I had heart surgery because of stress. And yeah. it's because I protected my family as best I could. Cause we went through, I mean, Honestly, it's like, listen, y'all share our story. You have no idea the parallels of things you've already said, but I know what it was like, what it did to the inside of me. And I didn't have anybody. I don't think we had anybody. Well, you, you, you went, you did some counseling with a, uh, a local pastor's wife for a little while in that town. Did I? Honestly, I don't even remember. Yeah, you did. You did. What about you, Carl? Did you have anybody? No, I didn't. I I was my, my, I've, I've got a wonderful family and they are always there for me, but they were living quite a distance away and they were very much involved in their own churches with their own stuff. And if I had reached out to them, they'd have been there for me, but I didn't because I just looked at it and said, Oh, I don't want to bother them. So yeah, I, I sucked it up then basically. Yeah. 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 And um, when they, when our, when it got down to our children, this is like a four, four month period when it got down to our children. Um, that's when it was like, we're gone. I'm out of here. We need to find a place to go to because we cannot do this anymore. And so we, um, we looked for about three months, you know, the, the process. And when we came down here, because I was in Northern Cal, so now we're in Southern Cal, um, back to my hometown, so to speak. Um, when we came to this church, I mean, we were, we were both broken, didn't honestly did not want to be in ministry anymore. I thought this is how this is the second time in my life that this has happened, like with Christians versus a teenager. Mm-hmm. And now and I'm like, mm, ministry, do not know if I want to do this again. This is really hard. Um, but we came down here. And uh, so in December, um, we moved in a week before Christmas to our new place. And the church board, well, church board, yeah, they they brought us. I mean, here we are. This living room is filled with boxes, right? I mean, it's just a mess, right? They brought us over a tree with ornaments. Did they bring gifts? Gifts for the kids. You got to remember, this is. I remember the tree, and I remember the ornaments. I don't remember gifts. It was all a very busy time. Um, and they said, and they said, yeah, they said your all your Christmas stuff is in boxes. We don't want you to have to find your boxes. Your kids need Christmas, so just take this and set up Christmas for them. That was our first year. So even though I was a mess, it was like that healing's beginning. And then a year and a half later, as we were moving from our condo to our home, me and the kids got chicken pox big time, all four of us, you know. And the church. Chicken pox as a grown up is brutal. Yes, yes, yes. But I had people, I had to have babysitting on Sunday, kids, adults sitting, because I, I lost like three weeks of my life. I was out of it that was so bad and plus the kids had and it was it. right the week we needed to move and it was in we the week we we're moving so i had um so i had people from the church come and watch me be with me while and the kids while he was you know got off on sundays preaching mm-hmm. when we moved because this was all we were moving from a condo to here the house had to be cleaned and this had to be done things had to be I didn't do anything. They packed up everything. They cleaned everything. They hauled it over. They unpacked it. They set it up at the new house for us. I couldn't do anything. I was so sick. They did, this church did all of this without asking. I mean, they coordinated it with him. Yeah. Yeah. But they did all, I knew, it was, in fact, our condo was left so clean. The landlord who we knew for years after that, he always he said, you, you guys were the nicest, the cleanest and this and that. And I always had to tell him it wasn't us, but I mean, <laughs> we did, we were good. We, we were good renters, but I mean, um, this is, but this is what these people did for us. Yeah. So each yeah. time these things happen, it's like a healing in me. It took me about five years mm-hmm. before I could trust anybody here, but these things were huge yeah. that we didn't even have to ask them to do. They did it. And it was like, they did it because they loved you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I only reason really. long time yeah. to think that people could love us. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you and when you're you in know? a church and you're participating in something like helping the pastor move, you forget about that later in almost no time at all. I mean, if you were to ask people who did that, they'd be like, yeah, I guess we helped out with that. It I yeah. guarantee you it didn't register for them, but it registered for us. So yeah, it's it one did. of those things where these small acts of simple kindness that are done at just the right season when somebody needs it the most are often of way greater import than the amount of output that you 
that you do in order to, to accomplish that. Yeah. And it's one of the ways that the Lord infuses his church with uh, uh, blessings that that are way beyond our ability to actually do. Yeah, And I think I know there's been times when a, a couple of times you've come home and made mistakes for whatever reason, you know. But no, no, no. I mean, just like you know what I mean. You know I know what you mean. But I mean, but, but you know, he's he'll say, "Yeah, I said this to the board," and then they they came back and maybe and and um, you said, "But that, but that was the right decision." But it was out of love, and we didn't have any oh, hard feelings. I know, I know what you said. Yeah, like that. You know, when, like, when I first came, you know, I said because I was still young in ministry, there would be times when I'd go in and, "Hey, I think we need to do this." And the board would pause and they'd think it through and they'd come up with a, something else. I don't think that's good, and here's why. So I'd go back after the board meeting, and she'd say, how'd it go? And I'd say, yeah, I presented that like we talked about, and they didn't like it. They had this idea instead, and she had immediately clench because of the previous experience. And I'd say, no, they actually had a better idea, and we actually have such a good relationship that they're honest with me, and they're kind about it, and we actually created something better. That's amazing. Carl, I want to yeah. ask you a question I bet no one's ever asked you, and I hope, <laughs> did you think at any point during all that you were going to lose Shelly? No. Which one? I mean, the church at, any, at, at the low point of the low point when she was not good. Not, not during one second did I ever worry that I would lose her. I mean, mentally. In any. <laughs> well, or, we're not gonna we're not gonna go there. I'm just just talking <laughs> about your marriage and stuff like no, that. No, no. I mean, we've been through rough seasons where we've had you know seasons of we just can't seem to agree on anything and all of that. But even in those times, we are going to fight our way through this. Mm -hmm. We're not going to leave it. That never entered either of our heads that either one of us for ourselves, that we were going to do it or the thought that the other person might do it. It didn't occur to me mm -hmm. at all that that might happen with no. you. And I don't think it happened for you. Uh, because I mean, I come from a, my family, my parents divorced when I was 12. And I, when um, that was a criteria when I got married was I'm not doing that to my children. I'm not going to do give my children that kind of life. And we both kind of felt that way. Now, if there had been, you know, a physical abuse or something that yeah, that's, yeah, that's but, you know, that's that yeah. that aside, there's been none of that. Um, no. You just, you know, in marriage, there's certain times um, years later. I mean, you're, you're learning to live with each other. And that's that doesn't change after one year of, of marriage. That's I mean, we're still learning yeah. things about each other but, at 40 years. And so. I, I can tell you this, though, if it had gotten severe enough where I could see that she was not going to be able to recover from this and stay in ministry, I would have very quickly left ministry. That was my next question. For, for her restoration, mm -hmm. that I would have done that in a heartbeat. I did get the gift of coming here and him saying, him telling the church that she will not do anything. Without that, I don't know if I could have made it yeah. because I was in such a state from that previous place. And it does happen in ministry. It does happen to people. And, and I know a lot of people out there, if they're going through anything like this, they just sit there and live with it. Cause they think they, they don't have anywhere to go. Well, but the, the he gave I, me a gift when we came here. I'm so glad he said oh. what he said. Cause I was going to ask you. If oh, hang you, on. If, you're, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Right. Uh, okay. Are we here now? You're on. You're, I'm not hearing you at all, Dale. You're breaking up and your image is frozen. Oh, no. Yeah. And I think is, it may be behind. Is it back now? It's back now. There we go. Okay. okay. All right. So I, I can edit that out. So uh, I was going to ask you the question about would you step away from ministry to save your family, basically? And you already had said that. So here's what I want you to address. There are people right now going through what you were going through. And the thing that healed you, it sounds like, obviously Jesus, but Jesus' body is what healed you. Those, mm -hmm. those kind people at that church. Some of the people listening don't have that. Right. They don't have that kind church. What, 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 would, what would you tell them to do right now based on your experience, Carl? Well, we've had both experiences. We've had an experience where we did leave the church because they were it was so toxic and because the place was so dangerous for us. Mm -hmm. And we I'm came to another you. also broken church but it wasn't broken because they were uh, sinful and mean. It was broken because they had been hurt themselves. And so there's a big difference between a church that's messy because they've been hurt and a church that's messy because they're mean. Mm -hmm. And I'll stay and I'll fight for the church that's messy because it's been hurt. But if it's just mean, um, you really have to weigh uh, what it's going to cost you. And for us, with a young family, uh, so with a wife in crisis and with kids who are being affected, 
that I, I would have lost my family if I had stayed there for the amount of time that it was needed to fix that church. And that's why I left that church. And thankfully, I came to a healthy church, so I didn't end up leaving ministry permanently. But I did leave one church because their, their, yeah, their, their, their toxicity was of their own doing. And I came to a church that was hurting, but it wasn't of their own doing. And uh, a hurting church and a hurting pastor and family, the Lord used each of us to help heal the other. Well, see, the reason I wanted to go here is it, the, is it seems like people don't want to talk about this very much. That, and, and this is more common than not. And so I think, right. I, I, you know, I don't want to be negative uh -huh. or whatever, but there are just some mean churches in America. Uh -huh. They're just mean people. And, and, and the churches have split time and time and time again. And so many pastors chose to serve the church and lost their family. Yeah. And I just want them to know that, hey, even if you need to take a break, you can take a break from ministry for all season and, and not be out of the ministry forever. Yep. But you you got to get healthy first. And, and Carl, you know, one of the things that we've talked about in the past was just learning how to deal with trauma and the effects mm -hmm. of trauma. You you learned that firsthand, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I didn't know to call it that. Uh, and I've, I've since done enough research and learning and had conversations with folks who've been this to put some language to it, which really does help when you can name it as trauma, and then you can take a look at what trauma causes and how to overcome trauma, mm -hmm. these then give you handles to hold on to that can help you uh, pull yourself out of it. Uh, but when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard hard to see it. Um, yeah. And the, the, the wonderful part of it is, is when you do go through trauma and are able to find healing on the other side of it, you then become the wounded healer that helps others. It's the old saying of the guy's down in the pit and the, he's yelling for help. And the person who walks by jumps out in the pit with him says, what did you, now we're both stuck here. And he says, no, I've been down here before I know the way out. Um, and that's, that's what we now bring for other pastors as we're working with them, uh, both Shelly and I, you know, Shelly talked earlier about how she comes along uh, uh, with me when we do the conferences. One of the key things she does is she works the book table, but at that book table, she has conversations with pastors, with pastor spouses, uh, and so on that are uh, one confidential and two very mm -hmm. healing for them because she's able to talk in a very personal way, different than you know talking to the main speaker. There's a there's a distance there. There's a thing. There's a distance there that I have with people because I've been physically standing yeah. above them, talking at them for hours mm -hmm. that she doesn't have that meets them much more face to face. That is a real healing place for them, and it's coming out, finding healing from our trauma that allows us to be able to help them. And, and sometimes too, at that book table, um, some I've had many pastors or pastor's wives um, come to the table and they start to talk and they say, oh no, I probably shouldn't say that, you know? And I say, you know, listen, this space right here, where we are, I said, this is a safe space. I said, you can say anything you want, get it off your chest. So I'm not going to say anything and no one else is around. Usually it's at a, you know, during a, session or something. I said, you can say whatever you want. I'll try to help you, but it stops here. I don't even tell him. I said, this is a safe space for you. You can get whatever you need off your chest and we'll pray with you. We'll um, talk it through or whatever, you know, whatever's going to help you to get this because a lot of times they come to these conferences, you know, I mean, you know, as a pastor and it's just laying heavy on their heart and they need to let it lay it off to somebody. And sometimes that's me. And I'll just say, perfect. Cause it's not going be on this table. That's so cool. So one of the things I would like to suggest on this podcast, if you pastor are listening and you're specifically, uh, your wife is struggling. Shelly's a great resource. She would, she, and I, I'm, I'm volunteering her now, but I can tell you, she'd love to help your wife yeah, if, absolutely. She, if, if she's going if through it. Well, the, the thing that we do, you know, I've always said this and, and, and it's, even though we've made lots of progress in the last five years, I still say this, where does a pastor go when they're struggling? Where, where does a pastor go if they've gotten in something immoral or, or just where do they go if they're dealing with depression? Who do they turn to? And, and, and I think my experience has been that the pastor's wife, that's ramped up even further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, where does she go? Who does she turn to? And, and, and I think one of the great voids in America and maybe this is something we can work on together moving forward in the in the months and years ahead is to provide real authentic ministry to uh, pastor spouses. Uh, and so I'm volunteering you now, Shelly. So, you know, get ready. 
<laughs> you know, and yeah. maybe people reach out, maybe they won't. If you if you have as a pastor's wife, if you, you really have concerns or something's going on, or even I know I'm I'm not a real talker as far as sharing intimate details. I just that's just who I am. I know there are a lot of pastors' wives who just you know need to share those intimate details. Don't do that with someone in the church. You yeah. find someone outside the church, and that is a common. We might, I think most people know that, but if you find a pastor's wife even outside your denomination, mm, different denomination. Because even within your denomination, you know, there can be, um, you, you just don't feel as safe. So you find a Christian out, doesn't have to be a pastor's wife, but a good friend or maybe even a family member outside. But I mean, obviously, the first thing is they need to know the Lord. And at least you can start with that. Someone you know and trust that isn't going to talk. And, and that will even very important. That'll even give you an outsider perspective that it's important to have when you're so consumed within the church. Yes, yes. Even if it's someone in the church who can be trusted. They still don't have the perspective that you're going to need from the outside because they're often embroiled in it themselves. But also, too, what if that person leaves the church over yeah. something oh, yeah. that, too. that they don't agree with? And then they talk. Is that That's why it's important outside. You know, that's, that's very good wisdom right there. <laughs> Someone mm-hmm. who might be silent now may not always be silent. May not mm-hmm. always be silent. That's why. That's, that's why. That's wisdom. Yeah, well, let's make yeah. a shift here. You've been doing this for decades now, decades of ministry. Uh, tell me a couple of your yeah. highest highs. A couple of our highest, highest highs. highs. Yeah. Highest highs. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of balance all the other stuff. <laughs> I, I, go ahead. You got one. Go ahead. Okay. We moved, when we came here, we, when we got married and first started out in ministry, we asked the Lord, we want to go somewhere where we can raise our children in one place. We don't want to be moving around. Now, we thought that place was a couple other places. It was not. So when we came here, our kids are two, five and eight. And we said, Lord, we just we don't we don't want to be constantly every two to five years moving and uprooting our children. We've been here 31 years. So our children have graduated elementary, middle school, high school and college and now we have grandchildren mm-hmm. and to me, that is a very yeah. big high we've been to be here in this area with when we've got other family i've got my family members here i've got cousins you know and i've got uncle and you know other so i've got family members that are already here because my dad grew up here in la and he's got his family here so to me that is a high very much that we've got yeah. we have gotten to be here they've let us stay here for 31 years yeah. it's been a true blessing and now we are reaping the rewards of consistency, longevity, and healthy ministry for 31 years in the same place. Not everybody's called to that. Not, not everybody's going to get that. So it's not required. Mm-hmm. But if the Lord brings that to you as he has for us, we now get to have the experience of, mm-hmm. you know, dedicating the babies of people that we dedicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's so weird when you get to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, this is a, this is going to sound not like a high at all, yeah. but it, it's one of those real poignant moments that we just recently experienced that the Lord really gave to us. When I first came to the church 31 years ago, they had been through five pastors in the previous 10 years. And the 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 real elder of the church came to me. His name was Ron. And he said, Pastor, I want to support you. I want to pray with you. I want to help you. And he said, I want to do whatever I can to help you have longevity here. I want you to stay here long enough that you're the one who performs my funeral. Mm-hmm. And um, we announced that you know we were going to be stepping aside in December. We announced that a little over a year ago. And he kind of came to me and said, yeah, I want to change my mind on that now. Uh, <laughs> and in December, he took sick uh-huh. and within 10 days was, was gone to be with the Lord. Yeah. And days before my last day on staff, I performed his funeral. And that's a high. And, and those of us in ministry, yeah. all of us in ministry that's understand me. that. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the the, the it's almost poetic that yeah. that actually happened that way. And on in his in his at his funeral, I told people that story. I mean, there were gasps and sobs. I mean, he actually said that to you because. We're all reeling from the fact that he's gone so quickly. He was so healthy a week ago, mm-hmm. and now he's gone. And he was the anchor. He was the he and his wife were the last remaining founding members of our church that is 62, 63 years old this year. He's been so here from the first year. He and his wife. So he's the last one. And the that we look at that and go, what a blessing to actually be able to fulfill 
that prayer that he half jokingly said, mm -hmm. but that was really an important thing to him that we were able to provide that kind of consistency for him and for his family mm -hmm. and for the congregation, and that they have been able to provide that consistency for us. So, uh, so the, for, the biggest high for us is not a moment; it's it's all those moments strung together. It's it's ministry. It's really, yeah. it's what it is. It's what it's what helped you, got you through it. It kept you through it. So as we wrap up the podcast, I want to ask you both this question. Uh, I'll go with you first, Shelly, and then we'll Carl, we'll Carl we'll close it out. There's a pastor listening right now. <clears throat> He's in ministry. He's going through a difficult season. Uh, it's taxing on his family. Uh, if he sat down with with you for coffee, what would you tell him? I would tell him to um, first of all pray with your wife about what to do, but I would also say. Um, go and find a Christian counselor, a Christian therapist, um, because there is no shame in that. And I do think the tide is turning on this. I've, I've seen this in the last few years now that we've talked to pastors, other ministry leaders that they've had issues and they're in therapy. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you need that outside person who's actually trained in this to help you and can spot different things that you need. But first of all, definitely pray with your wife, your spouse, pray with your spouse. Because not all pastors are men. That's right. Pray with your spouse. And, um, and then uh, find either through your denomination or um, a Christian group or something, somebody, um, some group, you know, that you may know of that is a Christian who is a therapist and, and get the help, find out. And some will say, but I can't afford it. Uh, sliding scale or find uh, um, somebody, a group that will pay for it or something. I think that's most important first. Mm -hmm. Carl? That would be yeah. Point. In addition to that, I would, I would encourage pa pastor, you are probably doing a way better job than you think you are. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the, most of the pastors that I run into are doing extraordinary work. They're not seeing the numerical increase. They're not seeing the markers that they told should be the markers for success. And so they think they're failing. And this is one of the things that Shelley gets at the book table all the time and that I get on a regular basis after I've talked for a while. And they come and they say, for the first time in my life, I've gone to a conference and walked away feeling better about myself and not worse, realizing that I'm doing well and not I'm not a failure, that I don't have some other person's uh, version of success that I have to live up to. So, Pastor, you're probably doing a much better job than you think you are. Um, and so start with that encouragement. And then secondly, there are resources, like Shelley talked about, that can help you. And one of, the, one of the very few silver linings from the pandemic is that we now have grown comfortable with what we are doing right now, yes. the conversation uh, over Zoom or whatever video conference app you're using. And that is now available for counseling as well. Uh, in fact, a whole, most counselors are doing uh, quite a bit of that. So even if you're in a rural area and you don't have counselors around or you're in such a small area, you can't talk to anybody without it getting out to everybody mm -hmm. in town. Mm -hmm. You can do that uh, remotely yes. and it, it can be just as effective yes. as sitting in the room. Yes, that's another thing to definitely that. Can I just say one thing real quick, too, Absolutely. for anybody who's listening, who, who's feeling like that? The Lord has put pastors in any wherever you are, whether it's 10 people, 20 people, 50 people. The Lord's put you there for those people. Not that you're going to have, you know, a thousand within the next week, because I, I, I mean, we've been through this. That's the failure you're thinking of, but no, you're not failing. God has you there for those people for a purpose. And that is your success right there. You're not failing. When I wanted that to do this podcast, I reached out to you because I was thinking you would do exactly what you've done and be transparent and honest and let us in and see, because Carl, you are, you're well known. And so people assume when you're well known that you didn't go through all this stuff, <laughs> you know, oh, no, but, you, but you did. And, 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 you know, and, and it's, it was, it was painful and there's scars and those don't go away, but I really appreciate you both being here today. I love you and our friendship and look forward to, you know, doing lots of things together in the, in the future, but thanks for your honesty and your transparency today. And as I said, throughout the podcast, if you need help, you're listening now, you can always reach out to Carl and Shelly. You can reach out to me. I, I'd love to help you, but uh, don't keep going it alone. And pastors, most of all, don't sacrifice your family on the oh, altar of ministry. Don't do it. Well, guys, <laughs> thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it so Thank much. You, I know it's going to help a lot of folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the 95 Podcast. 
We look forward to sharing another episode with you next week. In the meantime, visit our website at 95network.org. The website is loaded with great resources created for small and mid-sized church leaders. Until next time, have a great week.